Congratulations oui, to merci it's an honor et to félicitations. So what I'd like to try uh, to do un, is to focus on a couple of things that I think undergird this link between technology and what we might call truth and indeed trust under siege. Um, and in particular, I'd like to look at uh, this um, donc, intertwining of technology, power and truth uh, and see what it yields in terms of vérité, what we should do. Because there's a lot of explaining and complaining, faire, but at the end of the day, we need to take action. Expliquer, um, and I would suggest that we need to rethink the way we're making decisions in this technologically related world. So to start with, power today, as we've been hearing throughout the day, is scattered. We heard it from the president of the ICRC, we heard it from um, power is scattered to people ICR, like the WannaCry hackers or like the extremist Buddhist en fait, monk uh, in Myanmar comme, who disregarded uh, the government's prohibition on his teaching qui, uh, uh, and just took to Facebook with his verbal abuse uh, of the Rohingyas and some horrific uh, photographs. Donc, uh, uh, the problem with the scattering of power en, is that there's no corresponding du, uh, assumption uh, of ethical eh bien, responsibility for the deployment of the power. Um, and, and in fact, we don't really even know who has the power. The second power dynamic is a concentration of power in the technology companies. Um, all the time in the news we hear about the so-called Big Five, the Amazon, and Google, and Facebook. But in fact, it goes much further, and not just to the Ubers of the world, but all the way down the chain to the startups. And the fundamental responsibility issue here is that they typically do not, and there are exceptions, but they typically do not think ethics first and then put their technology out there. In fact, many of them, I would suggest, have a proactive strategy of just do it and waiting until they have a head-on collision with a regulator or consumers who will stop them. Uh, and so the question here is, how do we rebalance the allocation of responsibility? And the starting point for me, at least at this point, is to say that this tagline that they're only a platform is simply no longer acceptable. Um, we can't have uh, online sex trafficking, recruiting of terrorists, and all manner of wrongdoing, and have these companies just saying that they are just a neutral platform. Um, on the other hand, we can have regulators off-targeting uh, and quashing innovation in ways that can also be negative um, for society. Um, now, the, the final point about power and, and technology is that technology has disempowered state institutions. Uh, starting with the law, we see that legal systems lag very far behind technology, which is constantly changing uh, and at an increasingly fast pace. And the law simply can't keep up. We see that legal systems are uh, very ill-equipped uh, with the cross-border impact of technology. Uh, and understandably, legislators just don't understand the technology. Uh, and similarly, state institutions are going to be falling short with respect to power. And there are many complicated examples. Uh, I'll stick to one, which is cyber warfare. I don't know of many states who could uh, run a cyber war without uh, recourse to the private sector or indeed individuals. So technology has Donc, totally disrupted this um, power dynamic. Uh, and the first part of the what we do question is that we need to make decisions in this new reality and not thinking about uh, a balance of power that is outdated, even a year or two outdated. Um, and now truth. Technology has also catalyzed this epidemic of uh, compromised truth. So fake news is, is a major example. Uh, but there Donc, are other les, examples out there. There's a Chinese app called Meitu that allows one to take away a few wrinkles and take away a few pounds in a matter of seconds enfin, and par then exemple, put a photo on a dating app. Uh, um, so there are all manner of contagions. Uh, but in order to enfin, do the right des, thing, in order to des, make des, good decisions, uh, we must insist on truth. Des, des the kind of scientifically verifiable or social uh, science uh, research-based uh, truth. And to Stephen's earlier point, I had the privilege of interviewing Salman Rushdie uh, a couple months ago, and he said, you know, it's not because you say the world is round that it's round. The world doesn't need you to believe that it's round for it to be so. Um, and I think we all, again, need to be uh, staunchly committed to truth. Uh, more generally, when we put all of these dynamics together, the power and the contagious nature of truth driven by technology, we have to ask ourselves what else about our decision-making needs to shift. 
les, la prise de décision, décision uh, les décisionnaires doivent uh, également uh, changer. Uh, tout d'abord, il faut élargir le débat. Les innovateurs et ceux qui contrôlent uh, ces innovations, uh, que ce soit des grandes entreprises ou des détenteurs de part à Silicon Valley, ne peuvent pas être les décideurs au nom de la société sur le fait de décider quand est-ce que la technologie va être disponible pour la société. J'ai le défi, j'ai ce défi à relever, mais il faut assurer la participation des institutions universitaires, des think tanks, ainsi que des gouvernements, etc. Mais il faut que ce soit fait au-delà des États-Unis et du monde occidental, car tous les impacts de la technologie sont différents de par le monde, mais ce sont des impacts mondiaux. Donc les seuls équilibres et vérifications sont faites par des institutions telles que la Commission européenne et par des groupes de lobbying aux États-Unis, etc. Ce qu'on veut faire au niveau de la prise de décision aussi, d'après moi, c'est de se porter, enfin, de porter un regard sur d'abord l'humanité. Et tout ce que je dis s'applique à tout type de technologie, que ce soit Bitcoin ou aussi Vian Space Travel ou les médias sociaux ou autres. Mais si on prend l'exemple de G-Net Editing, un patient qui a une maladie veut le médicament tout de suite. Et si maintenant on examine l'aspect social, il y a And if we look at humanity writ large, we're very concerned about potentially permanently altering the human germline. Uh, so all of these questions, though, have potential implications for individuals and for society and for what I would call humanity writ large. Um, and then finally, we need to um, look at this very uh, daunting and complex reality that we have with this complicated distribution of power, uh, lack of understanding about where it is and who's responsible. Uh, and we need to avoid taking refuge in the binary. So we seem to be suffering from an epidemic of binary decision making. I'll, as a London resident, I'll call out Brexit as the crowning example of a disastrous decision the only result of which could have been divisiveness and waste. But there are others. Um, a physical donc, example is President un, un Trump's wall, physique, one eh side or the other. We have transport for London, Trump, Uber, in Trump. or out. Il y a le transport à Londres, and Uber, I think we should Uber, be asking not so much uh, yes or no uh, with these technologies si oui that have non, both positive si and negative, but we should be asking when and under what circumstances how can we maximize the positive benefits and minimize the risks. Thank you very much. One thing I just wanted to ask what always troubles me. Vous demandez et ce qui euh, me trouble laws, toujours un peu, c'est que ces lois euh, américaines like Facebook, euh, are not really arrivent, euh, just, par exemple, Facebook, ce ne sont pas des publications, des publica um, des, qui ne publient pas. Highways. Ce sont en fait des autoroutes euh, sur lesquelles on peut mettre no tout un tas d'ordures et euh, personne n'est responsable, à moins que l'on soit responsable right? pour um, ce yet, qui passe sur notre route, eh bien, euh, c'est juste une route. Donc, lorsqu'on commence à parler de réglementation, notamment dans les démocraties occidentales, là, il y a un, 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 what, un effet uh, assez effrayant, car speech. on se dit qui va réglementer and, quoi and we'll et où va s'arrêter cette liberté d'expression. Mais je voulais vous How demander euh, quelle est l'étendue de cette restriction par rapport à la liberté de l'Internet C'est une question très bonne. D'abord, je dois dire que toutes ces entreprises ont beaucoup de marge pour la prise de décision éthique avant qu'on ne arrive à l'infringement sur la liberté de l'Internet. Um, and all of this will have to be about effective et, uh, ethical decision making above and beyond the law. Éthique, because as I said, the law will never catch up and we wouldn't want it to because the law would, un loi, would undoubtedly uh, cross certain lines. Um, but I am very, I should say, I'm very pro-innovation, I'm very pro-business, I'm very pro-free speech, and I don't think ethical decision-making tramples on any of that. Even in the U.S. and in the U.K., um, but in particular in the U.S., even the First Amendment doesn't protect some of the speech that I'm talking about. It doesn't protect uh, inciting murder. It doesn't protect certain kinds of hate speech. It certainly doesn't protect child pornography and online sex trafficking. 
Oui, comme on l'a dit, la liberté d'expression, pression, ça ne veut pas dire qu'il y a un incendie dans un théâtre bondé.